industry inside a nutshell. The show where we sail into our port of call discussing maritime history. Hello everyone, it's uh, nice to see you again. Today in this video we're going to be talking about the Britannic and it's a Britannic presentation and both me and DK are going to be hosting oh. the presentation. Um, so let's get started. So I will start and then DK, if you want to jump in, please do anytime. That's fine with me. Oh, so, that'd be nice. <laughs> and if you want to add anything, that's cool with me too. So yeah, this will be for Britannic's, Britannic Month in November for the anniversary of her sinking. So let's get started. So the SS Britannic. So, Brita so at the beginning of the 20th century, the um, White Star Line um, was in a rivalry between uh, themselves and Cunard and, uh, and other shipping lines too, but mainly Cunard. And Cunard had decided that they were going to, they were kind of losing money. They they were not um, getting the um, profits that they thought they should or would be getting. And part of that is because they were kind of behind the times. Uh, they, they, you know, other shipping lines were kind of building bigger ships and, um, and they were they were kind of losing money, so they needed to build new ships, bigger ships, and part of this was uh, was to build the two liners, RMS Lusitania, and the Mauritania, and the and because they because they hadn't got the money to pay for the Lusitania and Mauritania to be built, they had to approach the the British government, and part of the agreement was was that uh, they would pay to have Lusitania and Mauritania built. But what part of that is they would we they would be borrowing 2.7 million pounds. And that would be uh paid back over a 20-year period at a 2.7% um interest rate. Now basically what they wanted to do was um was to come up with a, a, a an agreement between uh, the British government and Cunard was to um, was to also use the Lusitania Mauritania in the event of war for auxiliary, auxiliary cruisers. Now, part of that agreement was to um, uh, that the the Lusitania and Mauritania would be built to British uh, battleship specification with high tensile steel, uh, high tensile steel, and basically to um, the high uh, uh, materials as possible. Um, now, uh, Lusitania was launched first, and the Mauritania was launched second. Um, but they needed to be fast as well. And the Lusitania and Mauritania were built with um, with Parsons uh, turbine engines, four of them. Um, uh, two of them would be high pressured, and the the other two would be low pressured, and they would. Um, Function. As depicted on my model, exactly. All, but all of these uh, um, engines had to function the four, the four propellers each, and the ships would travel up to twenty six knots. That's the top speed for the Lusitania and Mauritania, and the whole idea of this was to basically, um, for them to be able to outrun the enemy. In the in case of war, so that they would not be attacked, and they could prevent it be of uh, to be attacked. But obviously, we know that the Lusitania didn't escape that fate because she sank. Um, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> um, the but we did a whole month dedicated about the Lusitania. <laughs> we do. We need. We, we're going to have another one about the Lusitania. Yes. Um, oh, yes. And we've talked about it on this channel before, which we will put the <laughs> link down in the in the descriptions uh, for those videos. Um, but uh, Holland and Wolf, they they had a, a, a relationship with White Star Line. They'd always built White Star ships, and um, so they approached White Star Line approached um, Holland and Wolf, which was Lord Perry, the the uh, the owner of Holland and Wolf. 
and he they both sat down now this is how the story goes now it's not it's more legend rather than actual history it might i mean it could have happened you know maybe the lucid maybe the three ships were uh, previously talked about before this but um there was uh, a story that both uh, ismay and lord piri sat down at lord piri's london home and they were having dinner and they discussed about building three ships um and two big uh, three big ships the biggest ships that the world had ever seen and with luxury as well in mind but you see um these ships were not going to be designed for speed they were going to be built built for luxury and luxury only um so it the story goes is that the the uh, the olympic class started off at the on the bottom or, or the, sorry at the back of a napkin and um they both discussed um the cost and and the efficiency of it um but they also had to discuss on how they were going to fit these liners in because Harland and Wolf at the time was a pretty small yard and it, I mean it was big it was a big yard but it couldn't fit these I mean they'd never seen such ships before so they had to reconstruct Harland and Wolf to be able to fit these uh, liners in and the only two could be built at the same time and the third would be built later but although they they discussed three ships they were not very uh they, well they weren't they were not set that they were going to build the third ship. What they wanted to do was they wanted to see how the the other two would perform before they actually uh, committed to uh, to building the third vessel. So the Titanic and the Olympic would be built side by side, and the construction on the Titanic started in March 1907. Nine. Wait, oh eight, wasn't it? Yes, oh eight, and the construction of the Olympic would be started first. Mm -hmm. Um, so the Titanic and the Olympic were, I mean, it took three years to build them, and there was fifteen thousand men working on each ship. I mean, Harland and Wolf at the time was the biggest employer, and. Uh, so 15,000 men would work hard on these vessels and it wasn't very safe conditions neither. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of the men go deaf doing these things and they would be injured and there would be injuries and in many cases, deaths during the construction of these vessels. And heaven behold, it did happen on Titanic. On Titanic alone, eight men died in the construction of Titanic. Uh, so this just goes to show how dangerous it was to to build vessels in those days. I mean, one young lad um, was only 15, and uh, he fell from one of the gantries on board uh, on the on the side of Titanic, and he fell and he and he, and he and he was killed. So it just goes to show how how dangerous it was. And if you were injured building these ships, um. It would send you in in the in the poorhouse. It, it it there was no um, compensation for injuries or any unions for injuries. If you were injured, it would put you in the poorhouse and your family, because yep. these men were very poor, very poor men, yep. um, and you would be scared of your foreman as well. If you if your foreman went round tapping on the ship and you had one loose uh, rivet in the ship. You would have to redo it because these ships had to go on the water, so they couldn't have any. They couldn't couldn't afford any leaks to happen, and you would be docked your pay for for doing this sort sort of thing. So it was a very dangerous and very hard for these men. Um. So when the Olympic was launched in 1910. And then later, uh, the um, Titanic on the 31st of May, 1911. Uh, they, because the Olympic had done so well, uh, not only um, performing well, but also how popular she was, they then decided to put pen on paper and actually con uh, start construction of the third vessel, which would be laid in the exact same spot as Olympic. 
and her yard number would be 433. And her keel was officially laid on the 30th of November, 1911. It took, again, took three years to build the the Britannic. Now, but during the construction of the uh, the Britannic, um, unfortunately, there was a sad incident where, a, a very tragic incident where the Titanic, on her maiden voyage, um, after sailing on the on April 10th, 1912, um, Titanic struck an iceberg at 11.40 p.m. on the 14th of April, 1912. And during what, and sadly, Titanic would later sink uh, on April 15th, 1912 at 2.20. It took two hours and 40 minutes for her to sink. But what they found on Titanic, and she, and she would cost the lives of 1,496 of her passengers. But what they found on Titanic is that the British Board of Trade um, was way out of date. It was more than 10 years out of date. And any ship um, above 10,000 tonnes would only be obliged to carry 16 lifeboats. Now, Titanic was actually carrying four more than the law required her to, to mm -hmm. do. And those other four sh uh, lifeboats would be collapsible type lifeboats which only would fit around 40 people. Whereas the others, the other normal lifeboats, would have carried around maybe 60 to 70 people. But also what they found with the Titanic is that there, was, um, there wasn't an efficient way of getting the two last collapsibles off the ship. So they had to throw them off, which they were actually uh, stored on top of the office quarters on board Titanic. And um, when the Titanic when the Titanic was sinking, they had to float the two collapsible lifeboats off. And it was collapsible A and collapsible B. One actually turned upside down and could not be righted. So they had to float them off. So in the two hours and 40 minutes that it took Titanic to sink, they didn't get them all off not in time and they had to float the two of them off and with men and women clambering on top of the keel of these boats and obviously lifeboat a as well which had which had got off uh, as it right it did right it, it did it did get off okay yeah um but now when the news got back to Holland and Wolf that the Titanic had sunk now, everyone, th there is a uh, a myth or a rumor or shall I say a legend that work had stopped on the third vessel as soon as the Titanic had sunk. And it, it wasn't the case. Actually, Holland and the Wolf, it was business as usual because they knew that Britannic was very early on in a construction. I mean, even her hull platings haven't been, hadn't been fitted yet. So, she, you know, so she was, she was very early on. So they knew that any findings from the Titanic inquiry, they could implement these changes into Britannic. Now, it is believed that Edward Wilding was, um, who actually took part in the Titanic inquiry, Edward Wilding, after Thomas Andrews Jr. had gone down with the Titanic, who was the original um, uh, ship, uh, ship designer, he was the um, head of the design department, he had died on board Titanic. And because of this, um, it is possible that Edward Wilding actually took over the 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 um the construction or the design of Britannic. And it's possible that he implemented a lot of the safety features that was implemented into Britannic because of Titanic. And of one of them even included a double double hull, which is basically an hour show protecting the inside. And the gantry have a cranes that you see back here on this on the near the fourth funnel. And even there's one up near the where the first funnel is. Now, yeah. considering that this is a hospital ship, it does even feel incomplete because it did not have one here or the other two back here as originally intended. That's correct. So what what they wanted to do with the Britannic, um, and I think like I say, I think Edward Wilding took a look at the design of Britannic and tried something new with Britannic. And that was, they, they added, uh, cause of the, the, um, the emphasis, uh, uh, the, the, 
because they had no efficient way of getting these collapsibles off the 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 tops of the um, the tops of the uh, officers' quarters on Titanic, they had to throw them off, and because they had to be thrown off, and they didn't have time to put them in a davit and and lower them normally. Um, so they needed an efficient way, more than an efficient way of getting passengers or, or off a off the sinking ship, or if the ship was in any danger of sinking. Uh, the Britannic, so he took a look at the design of, and implemented these big crane gantry davits, and they were like big arms, and they were capable of launching a lifeboat within minutes, if not. You know, less. I mean, it probably would have took about twelve minutes altogether, twelve fifteen minutes to launch a lifeboat on Titanic. With these gantry davits, they could launch a lifeboat within five minutes. Uh, it was just so quick. Um, and the other thing that they what they found is that the gantry davits would also function even if there's a great list to the vessel and the the gantry davits could also um launch a lifeboat from the opposite side of the vessel which is again it's cutting edge um and i've always and i've always said that these gantry davits have been given a really bad name uh, and not really well liked but you know what harland and wolf wanted to do and white star was to make sure that these that that the britannic is safer and it's a set and, and getting passengers off safer too, and in a, in a very swift way. So they worked and they did work. Um, the other thing that they did was they added, as, as DK said, they added a double hull to the vessel, which would then prevent the vessel from um, opening, up, opening up too many seams um, and opening too many compartments. And to, and the bulkheads also went higher, and there was an extra watertight bulkhead added to the electric engine room, which which would um, calculate Britannic's uh, watertight compartments up to 16 watertight compartments. And she could flood up to six watertight compartments with any with no danger to the vessel at all. Um, but the, the double hull uh, went as... Uh, and it was also implemented on the Olympic after the Titanic disaster. So the Olympic also had a double hull added to her, and it only extended as far as the bow to the engine room. So it did not extend the full width of the vessel, it only went as, as as far as half of the vessel, which was the engine room. And it was just to protect the inner hull from any grounding or any iceberg damage. Uh, so that and uh, and it just wouldn't happen again. They also added. This was not a safety feature. This was just added because Britannic was going to be experiencing more more stresses than her older two sisters. They added two extra um, expansion joints on the on the vessel. Now, expansion joints, what they are, is a it's a thing that is built into the superstructure of the vessel. And what they're designed to do is to take stress away from the structure, the superstructure, over rough, rough weather rough seas and it was also to make things a little bit more comfortable for those people on the the the, the tight on the on the titanic britannic and the olympic um so it was a, and but the design was also changed on britannic and it uh whereas britannic uh, titanic and olympics uh, expansion joint was just a straight cut down into the um expansion into the superstructure the the Britannics was a bulb shaped, and actually the Queen Mary has the same expansion joint as Britannic. Um, now, so with all these um, safety features added to her, but unfortunately Britannic wouldn't be finished until sadly um, until February uh, February twenty sixth, nineteen fourteen is when she was launched, and I'm going to show you uh, just a small clip of her launch before I go on to other things.
Hey, oh, Jay, can you explain more about the launch of the uh, RMS Britannic? Well, would have been RMS Britannic, but not legally RMS Britannic. <laughs> So as you can see here, the Britannic is having her funnels fitted, which would have been a very, very big uh, task, wouldn't it, DK? <laughs> Sorry, mic was would turned you... off. Yeah, those funnels are 
very gargantuan. They're about 65 feet tall. If you think about it, it's about the same equivalent to a three-story house. Yeah. In fact, the, the funnels on board the Olympic class were the same size, same height as Buckingham Palace in, in England. True, true. Yeah. So if you look at the, the height of um, Buckingham Palace, you're looking at the funnels. The height of the funnel yeah. on the Olympic I'll class. I'll remember that when I uh, travel overseas to the United <laughs> Kingdom and see Buckingham Palace for myself. Exactly. And as we all know, we all know what happened to all the Titanic's funnels that they all did completely fell over during the sinking. Yeah. They did. And they did kill people. Yeah, even uh, the father of a, a tennis player even got crushed by one of these massive funnels. Yeah. I mean, it's a mammoth task. I mean, look at that huge crane just picking up that one funnel. It's it's just crazy. And look at all the men swarming the bottom of the funnel just to make sure that it goes in place. Yep. Like, if th- but if you think about it, back in those days, if something went wrong just there with those men, that's the, that's game over for them. Game over. If you think about it, these cranes came from a German company, so you gotta realize this. This was years before the political tensions be- between all across the Europe intensified before leading up to the First World War. Exactly, exactly. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, like as DK says, uh, during this time, uh, not only was um, political p- political um, tensions rising in Ireland alone. Uh, which was which was which was starting even when Titanic was being constructed, and it was it was basically between the Protestants and the um and the Catholics and the Christians and it, it was the Republicans and it 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 was just a really treacherous time to work, be working in a shipyard that is was known to be Protestant and um. It was really tough for the Catholics in those days, and men would men were beat up. Violence was happening, um, so we have to remember that. And also, not only that, uh, tensions were rising within Europe alone, and people were aware that a war was imminent. Really, it was it was coming. Um, tensions were really rising between uh, with between the UK and Germany. And so it was it was creeping up and people knew this. And this is why, um, you know, the Lusitania and Mauritania were built in, in case of war because they knew even when Lusitania and Mauritania that maybe there was a war, a world war coming in the next few years. So they, they wanted them to be ready in case. Um, so, yeah, um, but it is what it is. But we're going to go on to um, Britannic as as a passenger ship as she would have been. Now, bearing in mind, you know, things were changing by the time Britannic was coming around. You know, think uh, taste was changing and, they, and Britannic had to keep up with this and the White Star Line did. So what they did with the Britannic, um, they added more entrances and more... Um, luxuries for both uh, second and the third class and even first class um, the first class were treated to a German built um, um, uh, organ self playing organ which would have been placed at the foot of the grand staircase the forward grand staircase and the whole idea of this was to save the company money from say, um, paying out for musicians to come and work for them uh, well, to work on board the vessels to play music for the um, the passengers, and it, the whole idea as well was um, so that the music could be heard from all areas of the vessel, so that everyone would be treated to some kind of tune, <laughs> and depending <laughs> on the 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 time of year. So, if it was Christmas, you would hear jingle bells coming from the grand staircase, and I'm sure the third class would have appreciated that because they would have heard it from further back and it would have been very soothing for them and enjoyable um so it was it was really entertainment not only for first class even though it was intended for first class 
but I'm sure it would have been entertaining for all sorts of people on board the vessel. Um, the other thing that they they wanted to do with um, the Britannic was to build her more, to be more um, catered for the the working class, the third class, and that was also to add a shelter deck on the on the stern, which would have gave them shelter from the elements uh, that the the um, that you know winter or autumn would throw at them and certain times of the year um so that they could have a pleasant walk on on deck without being without getting soaked um so it was it was just it, you know and also in, in second class um the second class would have been given uh, a gymnasium which would have been added on the stern area just below the set the aft second class stairwell on the in the shelter deck of C deck, uh, which you know is that was unheard of, and a playroom which was heard of before. I mean, the Lusitania had a playroom for children on board, but unfortunately, Titanic and Olympic didn't. Um, that was not added on the the other two sisters, but on Britannic, that would have been added, and the housing to the grand staircase on the port side would have been extended. Uh, to for an extra housing to be fitted for the playroom uh, for children. But on Titanic and Olympic, the children had to use one of the palm courts. The, uh, the other thing as well, the German line were building bigger and better ships than what had come before, and they were making their ships a lot luxurious than what was on the Olympic and Titanic. Um, so, And the swim pool on board uh, Titanic and uh, the Olympic was very basic, very basic indeed. So what mm -hmm. they wanted to do with Britannic mm -hmm. to keep up with the German line, to make her um, presentable and to make her, because uh, at the end of the day, she's she is a, um, she is for money. She is there as a as a money making thing. It, it, it was a market, and um, they had to sell her. They had to, they had to make her uh, appealing. For people as a, so the german lines were building bigger and um, better ships and more luxurious more, lu more luxurious ships and on the titanic and the olympic the swim baths were quite basic so what they needed to do was um as the uh the the britannic was a, a product uh for marketing uh for ticket sales was that they needed to attract more um attract the passengers and and sadly uh, a, a swimming pool just like Titanic's and Olympics, although it did really well back then, probably wouldn't have done very well for Britannic as times were moving on. Um, so they needed to make it more luxurious. So and not just not just swim baths, but all sorts of uh, on Britannic. Um, the Turkish bath was probably uh, um, redone, and you know uh, the reading and writing the ladies' reading and writing room was uh, smaller on uh britannic but on the swim the swim bus in general were really different and um they basically would have um changed the, the, as you can see in the picture the the swim bus were of a um medieval type looking um swim bus it was it was it was supposed to look very luxurious and also, as you could see from the far end, as you see on the starboard side of the vessel, now that would have been a catwalk on Titanic and Olympic, but because of the double hull, um, that was taken out and it was just a wall. So, you know, um, th th things were different. Things were, were, were coming on, changing. Um, also, the reception room on, on D-Deck uh, for Britannic would have been larger. And there was also a music room added for dancing and, and playing music. Um, the other thing uh, that was added on Britannic uh, for the uh, classes was um, instead of them just there just being an, um, a purser's office, there was also a post office on Britannic, mm -hmm. um, which was a totally separate entity in itself, um, where you could change your money and, and things like that. Um, so it was just, you know, cutting edge and things were really coming on. And she, in some ways, uh, very lux in more luxurious than her two sisters. And the, the other thing that, uh, was, was 
taken off the Britannic was the Caprizian. And instead of having uh, just the cap, take instead of having that, they extended the a la carte restaurant, which was really popular on the Titanic because everyone thinks that because Titanic sank, that she was a commercial uh, failure. Actually, she wasn't. She was a commercial um, success in the sense that things that were on Titanic was actually working. So uh, instead of them completely wiping it all out and just ignoring what was on Titanic because uh, Titanic became a a name of you know of um, disaster and, and sadness and and just uh, embarrassment for the the company they they didn't do that they in fact they embraced what was working on Titanic and Olympic and just expanded it on 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 Britannic um and and also instead of having just the barber's room on board Britan on board Britannic uh like there was on Titanic and Olympic um there was also a, a pamper room and 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 makeup room for the ladies it was just everything was really catered for every need on board Britannic. And um, the a la carte restaurant was extended the whole width of the vessel. But because the bulkheads had been raised from um, uh, E deck, like on Titanic Olympic, they were raised right up to B deck. Five of them went up as far as B deck. And um, and all uh, this came with its own um, things of... Uh, there would be more watertight doors and and more doors that passengers would need to to go through because of the bulkheads being raised. So you would see another door that probably wasn't on on Titanic, but you know it was just Britannic was just designed to be more luxurious uh, and to be safer, and and that's really what they were looking at and looking for. And in fact, um, there was a quote in the um, launch booklet uh, that uh, I will get up now. It was a quote that was that was said in the in the booklet that um, that Britannic represented a new um, a new clean slate for what happened before. You know, it was it was to try and and um, encourage people to say, okay, we know the Titanic sank, but you know, we have learned, we've learned our lesson and Britannic is so much more safer and more seaworthy. I'm not saying that Titanic wasn't, but, you know, uh, they needed to sell Britannic like this and um, uh, to basically just try and, you know, um, put a bandage on, you know, Band-Aid on and... The, in the booklet, it says, "In the New Britannic, we see both, we see both, we see both in design and construction as perfect as a perfect specimen of man's creative power, as it is possible to create. Hopefully, this time they'd got it right. So it's basically, you know, trying to um, repatch and repackage everything, and to basically show that the Olympic class were safe, even though." Um, of the disaster that came before. But other rooms were changing on Britannic. And again, they needed to upgrade her and, and to come up with uh, new new ways of attracting um, the, you know, the newer um, styles. And this was no different when it came to the smoking room on Britannic. A Britannic smoking room would have been very different on uh, the Britannic uh, as as it was on the Titanic Olympic. As you can see from the picture, how different compared to the two sisters. Um, it was not as large and it wasn't as, that um, you didn't have the stained glass windows and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was, it was grand, but basic. And that's what they were going for, you know. Um, as you can see, there's a there's a dome shaped ceiling in the middle of the room that Britannic, the Olympic and Titanic didn't um, have or wasn't going to have. Uh, not everything changed. As you can see, the 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 lounge was very much the same as what was on um, the Titanic Olympic. Some things were staying the same. And as I said about the organ, <laughs> and there is a video on the channel, and we will put the link below 
uh, that recently came out, which talks about the the Britannic organ, and you can still the organ because um, Britannic became a hospital ship. The and most of her ornate um, and and grandeur was never fitted onto the vessel, um, and that's including the organ. Now the organ was a German-made organ, and now you can imagine the they're at war. And they're not going to want a German organ on the vessel, but also it's also to do with time. Um, so the organ never made it on Britannic, and it still is around today, and it can be seen in um, Switzerland in a museum in Switzerland, and it still plays. Um, you could always purchase an audio CD as well. You can. It has it has recorded CDs, so it's a very famous organ through that in itself. But um, in two thousand and seven, it was. Um, it was confirmed to be the organ that was intended for Britannic. But as we know, the war started in August 1914. And now, it straight away, Britannic was not thrown into the war, wasn't thrown into hospital ship. Um, in fact, the Admiralty were very sceptical and very wary about approaching um, the... the uh, the, the ships that would have been used for passenger service. Now, this is because that um, ships that were used for passenger service were built just for passenger trade. Now, you would have to convert them ready for war. Now, unfortunately, Britannic had been, after her launch, she'd been, she'd been laid up for around six months. Now, they were doing the odd bits to Britannic, and this was... Uh, but when the war came in, it really did come to not a, a complete halt, but it did kind of come to a slow a, a slow pace. Now, this is because um, the White Star Line had, well, Harland and Wolf had a dispute with White Star Line. And this is because um, White Star Line owed £585,000 to Harland and Wolf. So they were in debt with Harland and Wolf. So they refused to fully complete Britannic. And... Um, so now, although Lusitania and Mauritania were built to be auxiliary cruisers, now bearing in mind the Lusitania and Mauritania were very fast ships and they could consume up to a thousand tons a day. Now, it, the Admiralty did, could not afford, with all the um, cuts and, and money spending, uh, the funding for these things was cut uh, to a minimum. Uh, they could only really um, afford to to put the Mauritania in in war service, but that didn't stop the uh, the Admiralty for using Lusitania uh, for uh, for war purposes, even though she was running as a passenger ship during the First World War. So they were very sceptical. But even but even approaching ships like the Lus uh, the Britannic and the Olympic, they were very unsure because. Although the Britannic and Olympic were very, um, they were slower than the than the Lusitania and Mauritania, which then they would consume less co less coal um, than the the two sh than those um, two ships. They they would only consume to six hundred and fifty tons, which is which is still again it, the the Admiralty really had to think whether it was um, conceivable to put um, these these ships into um, passengers into a war service but the other thing is is it's it's also converting the ready, ready for war service luckily for britannic i mean she was not fully completed so realistically they wouldn't have to really spend as much to convert her because she hadn't really had her interiors fitted as a passenger ship so you know but again it, it still came at a cost but they did approach because the the war the war had, had really claimed a lot of casualties, and casualties were rising. Now you've got to imagine this is before um, air travel and 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 planes and and you know aviation. And the only way to get um, wounded soldiers from the uh, from the war at the war zones was by ocean. So they could not really ignore the size of Britannic, and they could not ignore the space that she could she could have uh, you know for for wounded soldiers so they agreed with the white star line that they would pay for the Olymp for the britannic to be completed 
and that she would have to be used as a hospital ship uh, under the British Red Cross. But the other, but the other thing that they agreed was that they would pay seventy five thousand pounds to the White Star Line for the use of Britannic, um, and they would also they would also um, help with the running cost of Britannic. Um, so the agreement was was signed and it was ready, and Britannic was being converted into a hospital ship. Now, bearing in mind this happened around. I'm going to say October, November. It was November time when Britannic was um, was uh, was was uh, called into hospital service. Um, Britannic had to be ready within a month, and but she had to be painted into the international known colours for the British Red Cross or hospitals, um, and this was on both sides of the war. And the agreement was that no U-boat would attack a civilian, uh, a, a hospital ship. And uh, so that was the agreement on both sides of the war. It's um, a massive, massive war crime. If you were to fire upon one of these hospital ships, uh, Captain Swigger, be prior before he fired a torpedo at the Lusitania, fired a torpedo at a hospital ship, and luckily it missed. And had that happened, had that hospital yeah. ship been sunk by Captain Swigger, mm -hmm. it would look bad on Germany's side Absolutely. whatsoever. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's 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 the way it is. It, it was an agreement, and they had to stick to it. Otherwise, it would be classed as a war crime. Anyway, um, but because how quickly Britannic had to be converted into a hospital ship, Britannic was designed to be strengthened in eight different places to be able to take these huge gantry davits, and these gantry davits really did not take on very well within the shipping um shipping business or the shipbuilding business uh and uh so only three ships in history that's including britannic would ever ever have these these gantry davits and they were on a smaller scale on other ships and one of them was actually another white star ship called the rms doric and she was one of the other so she was the other ship that had these gantry davits and we still use them to this day, but on a very smaller scale. We still use electronic way of getting lifeboats off the vessel. But on Britannic as well, she was going to have two motor launches. Now, this, again, has never been heard of, well, wasn't heard of up until Britannic, where you would have motorised lifeboats. But these motorised motorized lifeboats wouldn't be just motorised, but they would also, and they were called motor launches, but they would also have Marconi, so you were you was able so if your ship sank, you was able to send a message, a distress call from your lifeboat. I mean, it they thought of everything when it came to Britannic, everything. Um so Britannic was ready by she she was ready by December 1915. So only five of the original eight eight gantry davits were ever fitted to the vessel. There were six well in type davits added to each side of the ship to make up the loss of the gantry davits, but also there was two more uh, lifeboats, um, welling davits added to the stern, because as the gantry davits were gonna added, was gonna be added to the stern as well. Um, so, to, so altogether, Britannic would have had 55 lifeboats altogether, but also they added a telephone to the uh, wireless room so that the captain, if there was any distress calls that needed to be sent out, the captain didn't have to leave or any of the officers didn't have to leave the bridge. They could phone from the bridge to ring through to the wireless room to give them an order, basically. Um, so Britannic was Britannic was ready for by December 1915 and her maiden voyage started on the 23rd of December 1915 so a day before christmas eve and she she left um she left liverpool um and but there was a problem that was picked up on britannic that happened on its maiden voyage britannic had to be um anchored offshore um and this was because um Colonel, uh, Colonel Anderson, uh, uh, not Colonel Anderson, Lu uh, Lieutenant a a Atkinson had reported that um, uh, a Dr. Goodman had 
two wards flood two of his wards flooded completely underwater because a water a, a leaky um a leaky valve a broken valve in the ship's water tank had completely failed but also there was a leaky portal that wasn't sealed very well so that was also flooding his um his wards so that so there was this um i suppose it's the same with any new ship there's always going to be teething problems this is why usually they send designers along with the vessel and a, and a gantry and 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 a guarantee group and um, so yeah so it wasn't always it wasn't smooth sailing right from the beginning um so Britannic war uh, so Britannic's uh first class areas and and other parts of the ship were turning to were, were turned into um uh, os uh, uh, operating theaters and wards and a lot of the promenades were also turned into wards and the Britannic could fit on up to over 3000 wounded soldiers on board the vessel by the time she was finished now these lucky I would say these three right kind here. of lucky, kind <laughs> of lucky. One of them wasn't so lucky, um, but they were lucky in one way or another. Now, Violet Jessup, I'm going to start with Violet Jessup because Violet Jessup, as we all know, we all know Violet Jessup, Miss Unsinkable. Uh, Violet Jessup was born in Argentina to Irish um, immigrants and um uh, Violet was uh, basically very lucky from young age. She was diagnosed with TB from a, when she was a child, and a doctor only gave her maybe weeks to live, but she survived. And um, but Violet's life was very was turmoil from the beginning. She had to be the breadwinner, and she had to be the elder one because sadly. Her father passed away when she was very young and her mother emigrated to England and Violet attended um, a convent school while she was in um, in England, while she, was a kid, when, while she was a child. But Violet had to leave school very early because um, her mother fell ill and uh, her mother was a stewardess and she worked for the Royal Mail Line, but her mother fell ill and she could no longer work on, on the ocean anymore. So Violet had to get a job and she had to get a job very quickly. So uh, Violet got a job with the Royal Mail Line um, and Violet, um, very, Violet's first ship was in 1908 and she sailed on the Orinoco. And um, she stayed on the Orinoco and the Royal Mail Line for quite some time until around September 1911 when she decided to join the White Star Line. Now, she didn't really want to join the White Star Line at the beginning because she did not like when the, with, with what the, um, the Atlantic, the North Atlantic, would throw at them. Uh, she did not like the gales and the storms that the Atlantic would throw at them. So she didn't really want to join the White Star Line straight away. And we do have a video about Violet, and there is a Violet interview, Violet Jessup interview, which we will put down in the links below um, so that you can um, go over and see and listen to that. And um, Violet um, Violet was involved when the Olympic collided with a Hawk, with the HMHS Hawk, which was a battle cruiser, um, in September 1911, and she was um, just off the Solent, and they had gone um, kind of diagonal, and the Olympic draw, drew the hawk into her stern, and they collided. And um, Violet remembers the collision very well. She said that it was it was very you could you know something had happened. You knew something really bad had happened because um, there was a quite a quite a knock. Um, quite a bang. Anyway, um, Violet then went to serve on the Titanic, the second of the Olympic class vessels. Now, Violet didn't really want to join the Titanic. You can understand her survive, uh, her going through the ordeal on the Olympic. She kind of was probably a bit wary about joining the Titanic, but her a couple of her friends had persuaded Violet to 
um, sail with them on the Titanic to get a, you know, to work on Titanic. And she did. She she gave in and she said it might, you know, it could be fun, you know, uh, whatever. And um, so she boarded the Titanic in April 1912. And um, Violet uh, said the voyage was, um, she'd work very long hours. She'd work up to between 14 to 17 hours a day. And um, she said that she made a few friends, and one in particular was uh, the young violin violinist, uh, Jock Hume, who she came across very often. And she she particularly mentions um, our, uh, Thomas Andrews and how friendly Thomas Andrews was, the design of the ship. And she said that he would always take um, suggestions off the crew uh, on improvements that he could make to maybe titanic and or the third vessel or even olympic um violet remembers the night the titanic struck the iceberg she said that um she said that there didn't seem to be any um, immediate danger there was no panic there was no um you know any inkling that the uh or any something had happened to the vessel and then violet said that she got into lifeboat 16 and she said that um, she was handed this baby and she said that um, she called the officer Mason, which was probably sixth, sixth officer Moody, who was working around lifeboat 16 at the time with officer Lowe, who was working on lifeboat 14. Um, Violet was added to this baby and she, the, the officer said, please take care of this baby. So she was loaded away into the lifeboat and she remembers the Titanic sinking. She said it was just, dreadful with all the screams and the cries from the passengers on the vessel. And the ship just disappeared. And she said, um, when she reached the Carpathia the next morning, she said that um, this woman came up to her and she just took the baby away from her. She didn't, the, the woman didn't say anything, not a thing. And she just took that, maybe that was the mother. And um, Years later, uh, Violet went on to work on, uh, then she went on to work on the Britannic and Violet would work as the, as a British Red, uh, the, with the British Red Cross as a nurse. And Violet remembers um, when the Britannic struck the mine, she said, uh, would she, back then they thought it was a torpedo, that uh, there was this gigantic um Sh shaking through the vessel she was in the pantry getting her paddle butter and, and she was taking care of this nurse that was seasick and she just was completely useless and she said that um uh she was getting this woman this nurse ready to get into lifeboat so she could get down with a bit of dignity um violet then reached the boat deck and she said that she, she said that you could tell the ship was going down she said you, she you could tell that she was down by the head and uh, Violet was placed into lifeboat number four. Uh, well, what the captain was trying to do was beach the vessel um, because the vessel was was sinking and he, and he needed to beach the vessel. He was only a couple of miles from land. And the, the boat that she was in was lowered prematurely before the captain's order to abandon ship. And sadly, because the Britannic was now leaning so far over onto the starboard side, the the port propeller was now becoming on water level. So it was working above the above the water. And um her lifeboat was drawn in. And she said that she said that it was it was strange because she, she saw all these people jump out because she had a back to the boat. And she said that all these people just jumped out. And she said she didn't know how or why, but she said she did not know how to swim. She never learned how to swim. And she jumped and, and she, they jumped out, but she had to jump as well because she had no other choice. Otherwise, it's either you jump or get cut up by the propeller. You've got to imagine this is a 16 foot propeller coming at them. Anyway, she jumped into the water and she went under the water and she, she was trying to come to the surface. And as she tried to come to the surface, she banged her head onto something. And she, she, she said that her brain just rocked with pain, just gigantic pain through her, through her head as if you know someone had smashed a, a huge hammer on her head and she said that um she said that if she got another blow like that that should be finished done she was later picked up by um one of the lifeboats one of the um motor launches it was actually the port motor launch and um 
she said that <laughs> she said that a brother made a joke before she boarded the Britannic. She he said that sis sis if you if you're on a, on a sinking ship, make sure you put your toothbrush in your in your pocket. And she actually did because when she left Titanic, she had nothing. She she left it all behind. So this time she she took a toothbrush, which is what her brother told her to do. Um, Violet. Then she said the next. She said the next day when they were on land, they were in a hotel, and the matron came up to her and said, instead of asking how are you, uh, Violet, even though she was being sick the whole night because she was throwing up this installation that she inhaled from the Britannic, um, she just went, "Where did you get that toothbrush from?" I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um. So after the Britannic, Violet went on to serve on to the on other vessels, including the Olympic in the 1920s, and she was finally retired. She had a brief marriage with a John J John James Lewis or John Lewis, and he was also a steward. But it was very brief; it wasn't very long, and she finally retired in 1950, and she retired to a a cottage in Suffolk, and she said that. Years later, after the after the sinking of the Titanic, she had this phone call on a stormy night. She was on her own in a storm on a, in a stormy night, and she said that this this phone rang and and now it varies between that there was a woman on the end of the phone or a man. I, I tend to think it was a man, but you know who knows. But she said this this person was on the end of the phone and they said, "Do you remember the night the Titanic sank?" And she goes, "Yeah." And she goes, "Do you remember a baby being added added to you?" Yeah. Well, I was that baby, and Violet just put the phone down, thinking, "Yeah, okay, um, you know what in the odds." Anyway, she then and she said to uh, John Graham Maxton, who did a, a voice interview with her, said, "Well, it must have been the kids, you know, messing around in the village." And she said, "No, John, no, John, I never told anybody that story, not not one, never." So who knows? Anyway, Violet sadly passed away in 1971 at the age of 83. So that was the end of Violet. Then there was Arthur John Priest. Now he was a very lucky fellow. Arthur John Priest um, came very from a very poor background um, and he served on the uh, a vessel called the uh, Astorius, which never sunk by the way. People think that the ship sank it when uh, Arthur was on board, but it didn't. And he worked on it as a stoker, and then he joined the Olympic in nineteen in nineteen eleven, and worked as a, on her as a stoker. But he was also on board with Violet uh, on that vessel when the Olympic collided with Hawk in nineteen eleven. Uh, so you know another incident. Then Arthur was never put off. He went to work on Titanic, and he was again working as a stoker, and he would survive. Titanic sinking when she struck an iceberg in uh, on the fourteenth of April, nineteen fourteen, and it it's, it is reported that he came away from the Titanic with frostbitten toes. Anyway, Viol uh, Arthur was never no, again never put off. He went to work on the Britannic, but he was also on the Britannic with um uh, with his brother Harry Priest, and both were working as stoker and fireman, and um. Arthur Arthur survived Britannic sinking when she collided with the mine in 1916. Then Arthur went on to survive, and uh, but before the Britannic, sorry, let me go back. Before the Britannic, he was involved in another sinking called the the ship was called the uh, um, the Alcantara, and she was sunk on, in February 1916 um, in battle, and both ships sank each other by with a ship called the Grief. Which both they they both sank with it sank each other, and again Arthur survived, and then again as I said went on to survive Britannic sinking, and then he was involved in another sinking, and it was another hospital ship called the Donegal, and she was torpedoed on the seventeenth of April nineteen seventeen, and she was torpedoed in the English Channel, and both, and he was also on the Donegal with his brother, and he was also on board with Archie Jewell, who I will talk about in a moment. And both both his brother again survived, but, but it, it was reported that Arthur had suffered a serious head injury during 
during the sinking of the Donegal and could never work again at sea. It, it was later said that the reason why he never worked again at sea was because no one would sail with him because they always saw him as bad luck, which you could kind of understand in some ways. Uh, Arthur would die at the age of 49 on, on the 11th of February, 1937. He was working, he had a job in refrigeration systems and it's it's possible that he caught the flu and had gone back to, to work too early and sadly had caught pneumonia and he would he would pass away, surrounded by his family. Um, and um, he is buried in Hollybrook Cemetery. So that's the end of Arthur. Yes, as I was saying about um, Arthur John Priest, we're going to now go on to Arch Archie Jewell. Archie Jewell was uh, one of Titanic's six lookouts. Um, he had previously worked on the Oceanic and he'd been wor he'd worked on the Oceanic till uh, around 1904 and then he, got, he, he was on her for a while. And then he served, he was transferred from Oceanic onto the Titanic. And... Um, Archie Jewell was, um, he was relieved by Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee at around 10.40. So around, he was, he just got off duty just about an hour, around an hour before the Titanic struck her iceberg. So he could have been the guy that struck, that saw the iceberg, but he, he went off uh, duty just in, just before the, the iceberg collision. And it was Frederick Fleet that was famous for saying iceberg right ahead. And then Archie Jewell got off got off on lifeboat seven on on board Titanic, and um, he he remembers right. He wrote a letter to his sister, and he remembers the that he he used to um, he he can remember the cries and the screams from the dying on board the Titanic as the ship was sinking and having feeling useless because they couldn't do anything to help, and he would. His family would also say that Archie Jewell was so traumatized by the sinking that he would sometimes just cry, just suddenly burst out crying. And then, after the Titanic disaster, well, he did take he did take um, he actually took part in the Titanic inquiry and gave testimony. In fact, when he reached New uh, England, he was detained by the by the law, and. Uh, and he ha he took part in the inquiry and he and he actually spoke about it you know he answered the, qu the the questions and said that he was one of the Titanic six lookouts and he just basically sort of told them what he had seen and you can we can actually put a link to his testimony if you can find the website says um, with his testimony so you can go and have a look at that and uh, just see what 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 happened. Um, with his with when he was questioned, um, Archie Jewell then went on to serve on board the Britannic Titanic sister, and um, he was on board the Britannic as able seaman. And he said that in Archie Jewell was only a deck above from where the mine actually struck the vessel, and he said that he said that when the the mine struck, there was this like blinding powder in the air. Which then gives strength to the 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 mine um, incident because mines usually give off a gas once they explode, and this like powder was in the air like gas powder, and he said that it was quite blinding, and he said that there was this inrush of water, and he said that one guy uh, he had to climb up um, a ladder to the upper deck, and he said he remembers walking this this guy walking through a door. And he and it smacked him in the eye. The door hit him on, in the eye, and he and he had to be bandaged up because he he looked and he he kind of made a joke out of it. He said he looked like uh, old Nelson, um, and uh, so he was all patched up. And he said that he was put in uh, lifeboat. Well, he was put into a lifeboat, and it was and we believe it was possibly lifeboat number two because that was the other boat that was also cut up. And he and he actually wrote it wrote a letter letter to his sister. Um, basically giving testimony, basically telling her what how he escaped the Britannic, and he said that um, the lifeboat was cut up, and he was in that like he was in one of the lifeboats that were cut up, and he said that he went around like a like a whirl, 
and he said he was he was that close to death that he actually said goodbye to the world. Um, and he, and he said that uh, it was just so traumatic, and um, and he said all the blood and everything in the in the in the thing. And another guy that also noticed uh, who saw the lifeboats being cut up was a guy called George George Pierman, who was one of the Boy Scouts, and he saw one of the boat, what well, two of them being he saw them being cut up. He was actually uh, dangling from one of the sh um, ships. Uh, uh, Gantry Davits, he was hanging onto a rope and it actually burnt his ropes because he lowered himself into the water and it burnt his it burnt his hands. Um and he said he he got rope burn on his hands. And he and in later life his 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 parent well his his family said that um it he, he, he was so traumatized he suffered with PTSD and it and it actually it could have actually um uh imp it, you know impeded his uh, growth. And um, he remembers that you know all the blood in the in the sea, and that um, the white paint on the Britannic just suddenly turned red, uh, with with just it was just so horrible and gory. Anyway, Archie Joel um, survived the Britannic, but uh, a year later he was only twenty nine years old, and he had boarded the Donegal with Arthur John Priest, and. Um, the Donegal, as I said with Arthur, it was torpedoed in the English Channel on the 17th of April, 1917. And um, sadly, unfortunately, in this sinking, um, Archie Jewell did not survive the sinking and he was lost at sea and his body was never recovered. And sadly, he'd only just not long become a new father. And um, and he's got a memorial to him on the uh, Tower uh, the Tower Memorial in uh, in London, and uh, he's also mentioned on his wife and his child's, on his on his son's um, gravestone. Uh, so that's a bit of a memorial. But realistically, that's all the memorial he has. It's his only because his body was never recovered. So sadly, he lost his life at the age of, at the age of twenty nine years old. So they they were the three uh, people that had. Um, some connection to Titanic and Britannic um, all at the same time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pass this on to DK because uh, I know DK has a lot to say about U-boats and U-73 in general. So over to you, DK. Okay, no problemo. Now, when it comes to U-boats, you really cannot talk about World War I without mentioning U-boats. And for World War I, we've seen a wide array of newer technology being developed, such as rifles, machine guns, to even tanks as well. But however, some bad few things actually did came out of the first World War was possibly two, two common things. One, it was the introduction of chemical gas warfare, which was completely outlawed by the mid-20s. And also another one would be the U-boats. Now, when it comes to U-boats, you basically can't talk about the Britannic without mentioning U-73 and, of course, many other ships as well. The Germans developed the U-boats the way back into the mid-1850s. And back then, they were still testing the, them, but they didn't start putting it into to use until about the mid the, the mid 1910s you know adding on torpedo tubes and however and of course world war 1 kicks off and the royal navy did block tried to block off the germans tried starving them but germans had one thing in mind they want to try to cut off great britain for from any supplies being sent to them to the united states that means anything from weaponry to food to wartime material and as ever since the u-boats were introduced many ships were actually lost to the u-boats some that are direct ties with the rms titanic and stuff however the first one to be sunk was the hms pathfinder which was the first ship lost to a u-boat and also if you remember the Californian, the SS Californian, the same ship that failed to respond to Titanic's distress calls was sunk by two U-boats, the U-34 and U-35. Now, however, 
the controversy would happen on May 7th of 1915 as the RMS Lusitania right here was about to sail towards Liverpool, just off the old head of Kinsale, was torpedoed by U-20, to which I did mention, to which I did mention, and sank in 18 minutes with a great loss of nearly 1,200 lives, which includes 128 Americans. And this sinking alone outraged the public on why would they torpedo a, a civilian ship with no flags flying. However, there are cruiser rules in place around that time, and what they should have done was fire a direct warning shot at the uh, target ship, allowing them to get their passengers and their crew off safely, and they torpedoed the ship. U-20 never did that for the Lusitania. And unfortunately, the sinking of the Lusitania would be one of the biggest main factors of the United States to enter in to the First World War. Now, another ship that we're all familiar in the Titanic community, the HMS Hawk, the same ship that was involved with the collision of the RMS Olympic, was torpedoed by U-9. Another one is the Carpathia, to which most of us do remember as the rescue ship that saved 705 survivors from the RMS Titanic, was lost to U-55 in July of 1918. And of course, as we all know, the HNT Olympic happened to score a kill of her own by ramming into U-103 on its way to Cherbourg in 1918. And of course, when it comes to HMHS Britannic, there were only there was only one sub that actually did brought, brought the ship down. But however, it wasn't really by means of a torpedo, since it actually would violate wartime rules. And therefore, just like what I said, if you sink a hospital ship, it's a war crime, regardless of whatever side it is. However, the U-73 around that time was out in the Mediterranean near the uh, a GNC near the island of Kia laid down mines. Now, if you think about these mines, they are anchored down, and basically the bomb itself is just is just going to be up near to the waterline, just in case if a if a ship happened to brush up alongside it, it would instantly explode, and basically cause a warping of the hull. However, a week prior, before the Britannic sank, there was a French vessel, ex-German ship called the SS Bertigala, to which that we're all familiar with, was sunk by a mine from U-73. But however, they first thought was, okay, I think we got torpedoed, and they start firing on all direct sides because they don't know what's going on. They didn't know if they got torpedoed or not. Basically, if a ship were to get hit by a mine, it would create a false sense thinking, okay, we got torpedoed, where they where did it come from, and all that. That was not the case for near this area on the uh, GNC. Now, the U-boats, they were pretty big, big back in World War One. They did rank up, I forgot how many, uh, gross, ton, gross weight tonnage, but there, there was a lot, I think it was like 19 million, give or take, right there with a lot of ships that were completely lost to these U-boats, and these U-boats were actually still were actually used in World War II, but they were just more advanced more advanced. And however, around that time in World War II, we had radar, so that way we could be able to uh, track them, see where they're at, and take aversive action. So, however, for U-73, U for U-73, it was indeed built by the Germans. And around in October of 19. 1918, it was scuttled on purpose to uh, prevent Allied capture, even though that the captain did admit in his log that he did sank the Britannic. And if you think about this, torpedoes only have one target. Mines, they just sit and wait. Yep, that's that's basically it. I mean, uh, 
part of the just a slight correction on the number of survivors, uh, DK. The, the accepted number for Titanic survivors is seven hundred and twelve survivors. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah, the seven hundred and five is yeah, not too far off. But uh, okay. yeah, um, part of the problem with uh, the reason why the reason why the English were unaware that the Berdigala had been sunk by the mine was um the argument was is that uh is that um a mo- only a year before the the Lusitania had been sunk by a torpedo uh by a torpedo um which was very fresh in people's minds but the other thing is the british were unaware that the u boats had or the germans had the technology to um uh to to lay mines in very deep water so they thought it was impossible for U boats to be able to lay mines in such very in very deep water, um, um, but obviously they did have the case uh, the the technology, but they were not going to um, let the the British know this, uh, or you know, um, and sadly it could have saved Britannic. Um, but the thing is, as well, is um, it's like DK says, you know, mines do not discriminate. And unfortunately, although the mine was not there to sink a, a hospital ship, sadly, it was a hospital ship that came across the mine. But th- there is so many, um, there is so many ways uh, the the Britannic could have been saved. She could have been saved uh, through uh, not even going to the Dardanelles in the first place on her last voyage. Um, basically, the Aquitania had been damaged in a storm and uh, Britannic had only just arrived from her fifth voyage and she wasn't really supposed to go out. She only arrived around the first, maybe the second of November. She wasn't really supposed to go out when she did. And actually, Britannic had been in this in this storm herself but obviously the, the, the Britannica came off uh, unscathed, but unfortunately for the Aquitania, she did not. And the Aquitania had to be replaced by Britannic and Aquitania was sent um, back to the uh, her, her builders. And in fact, um, the Britannic did pass the Aquitania uh, just off, and she was just off the coast of Isle of Wight and, and Ada Garland, who was one of the nurses on Britannic, said that they had actually spotted the Aquitania and that they were glad that they didn't actually, that they were on the Britannic and not the Aquitania. The Britannic left at 2.23 in the afternoon on the 12th of November. She went out a week earlier than she was supposed to. And, uh, but before this, Britannic had been handed back to the White Star Line because the casualties were dropping and by June 1916, she was handed back to the White Star Line, and um, and the seventy five thousand pounds was 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 sent to the, was sent to the White Star Line, um, but unfortunately, as casualties were rising again, Britannic had to be pulled back into hospital service in August nineteen sixteen, and she was back at sea in October nineteen sixteen. Um, but sadly, again, this would be her one of her final times is she left on the 12th of november and she was sailing out um to go over to the dardanelles campaign again and uh, she was gonna she was heading for the clearing stations at lemnos she arrived at naples on the 17th of november 1916 and this was for her her coal refueling and some of the survivors said, well, some of the, the the nurses on board said that they had to, um, they they didn't go right into the dock. They actually stayed 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 out into the into the um, opening of the um, the the harbour, uh, the bay as they called it, and they were uh, go, they went over to to Naples to to take a, a visit of Naples uh, while the Britannic was being refuelled. But they said that it. Um, they had a lovely time. They went to um, many places like cathedrals and churches, and and uh, many com- commented how beautiful uh, Naples was. And they all got the chance to go to the uh, aquarium in um, in in Naples before they went to board back on Britannic. But unfortunately, Britannic could not leave. Um, they 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 were. Um, kept in Naples because there was a, a huge storm that had, had started up 
and it was raining and the sea was rough. And uh, so Captain Bartlett, who was the captain of the Britannic, who was late, who had the nickname of uh, Cap, um, uh, Iceberg Charlie because he had this, um, his crew would call him Iceberg Charlie because he had this um, ability to be able to smell ice from miles away. Um, captain Bartlett was also the superintendent of the White Star Line, um, which he was appointed the superintendent of the White Star Line in January 1916. And um, now, because Captain Bartlett didn't want to um, damage his ship, because you've got to imagine the Britannic is company property. She's still White Star property. But even so, she's still under the Admiralty as well. So they would have something to say if Captain Bartlett uh, recklessly um, took the ship through the, the narrow strait of the harbour of Naples. So he stopped his, he, he stayed at Naples until at least the Sunday, which was the 19th of November, when the storm died down and they were able to leave the Bay of uh, Naples. Uh, but as soon as they left Naples, they, the storm rose again. And one of the survivors, uh, uh, Sheila Macbeth, who was a nurse on board as well, uh, mentions how the ship was rocking so much that um, everybody in the room, any, any, any everybody on, on the ship, practically all the nurses, all had the face uh, of, of uh, the colour green. Their faces were green because of seasickness. Um, not many people could handle uh, being at sea. And some people, for many people, it was probably the first time they'd been at sea. So... You know, a lot of people suffered with seasickness. And Ada Garland also mentions how green people were because of the rough sea. Also, um, Jake, can I mention something to you? You can. For those that don't know, Naples is near where Mount Vesuvius is, which is well known for its eruption and the destruction of Pompeii in 79 AD. Mm -hmm. for, those, yeah. uh, for those in case they don't know, if you were to go to, into the port... Where the Britannic went, you could see that massive, massive volcano yeah. there. And it's still it, active to this very day, though, I it believe. Is. It is. I mean, uh, in fact, Ada Garland, uh, who, again, like I said, was a nurse on board, um, said in her, in her diary that uh, she saw this, uh, this uh, uh, volcano and she said that it was the very first time that she'd ever seen an eruption. From a volcano, and she 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 recollects seeing um, clouds of smoke and it coming out the top. And she says she saw the lava head towards the the ocean. She said it was a marvelous um, thing to see, uh, but scary as well. But it was a marvelous thing uh, to to be able to see this volcano erupt. So you know she lived a life. You know, uh, Ada Garland did. Um, anyway, uh, so. So everything was normal. Uh, the nurses were getting the, the beds ready. Bearing in mind, some of the nurses had five around 574 beds to make, and they had to do it in, in – I think they did it in two days. As, as Ada Garland recollects, they did it in around two days. And um, anyway, uh, as they were sailing through um, the, the uh, Naples – uh, through the uh, the Strait of um, uh, Zia Ch the Zia Channel, um, on the twenty first of November, nineteen sixteen, everyone was sitting around for breakfast, and Ada Garland recollects um, her being very late for breakfast. I think she says she was around twenty minutes late. As that's what she says in her diary, is that she was around twenty minutes late because she slept in. She wouldn't normally sleep in, but she seemed to have slept in at, at this point, and she said that. Um, she entered the, the the dining room and she sat down and she ordered, uh, she recollects, she, she ordered um, pears, uh, chopped up pears for a breakfast. And as soon as she started taking her, her first mouthful, and this was around 8, 12 a.m., there was a sudden um, bang uh, that, that had happened and it rocked the ship. And a, a violent um, vibration had gone through the ship and all the plates and glasses and everything just clashed to the floor and 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 smashed in a heap um and um so the stewards uh uh started panicking uh they ran out of the room but then they soon as she said that they, they soon came to their senses 
and um, said that everything's fine. Please sit down and uh, wait uh, wait for further instructions uh, because they thought they'd hit a barge. Or, or the Britannic had hit a barge, but clearly it was something uh, more serious than that. Um, and then, and then suddenly, uh, it, uh, the alarm went, uh, the siren went, and they all was ordered to go and get their life jackets from their cabins. And if they, and the problem is as well, the the Britannic had not a problem, but what they had was, um, uh, they had um, emergency staircases where the rules were you were not allowed to go down the staircase; you were supposed to go up. The reason why you weren't supposed to go down the staircase was because, in case there was an emergency and the staircases were were, um, were blocked by people, um, and if you couldn't make your way down to your your cabin because you know your cabin could, like the watertight doors could have been closed, preventing you to get down to your stair your your cabin to get your life jacket. There were spare stair spare um uh, life jackets on the on the uh, compass deck of the britannic um now captain bartlett um bearing in mind he had no sense of what was really going on with the britannic he was getting reports back and forth that there was flooding in certain areas of the ship the britannic had struck the mine between uh, holds two and three um and um and it had blown at least four compartments completely wide open. But what it had done as well, it had warped her steel. And bearing in mind, this was 8, 12 a.m. And um, the night staff was changing to the day staff, you know, the firemen and the stokers. And to give them easy access, now bearing in mind, this is against all uh, war regulations anyway, the doors were wide open to allow easy access through to the boiler rooms for the men to get to their stations. Uh, so when their mind struck, these doors were wide open. Now, there was three ways these doors could have been closed. There was um, a, 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 basically there was a float underneath the um, floor plates of the stokehold. And as soon as water came in through to, through the, the hull of the ship and it, the room started to flood, the float would float up and it would cat it would trigger a switch a catch on the water stack doors and they will suddenly drop into full uh, full closed position there was another way there was uh, some of the doors most of the doors on board the britannic were electronically were were able to be electronically closed through the bridge of the ship and uh, so the captain could um could uh, flick a switch and the the cat the bulkheads would be closed or the bulkhead doors would be closed or you could manually do it through a crank. So you'd get a crank and you would crank, uh, close them through by hand. Um, sadly, for two doors, this seems to have failed. Uh, there was a there was a boiler boiler room door, uh, fireman, a watertight door between the fireman's tunnel and boiler room six that had failed to close, which is believed to be due to the warping of the steel of the vessel. The other thing is there was another watertight door that had also failed to close, uh, which was between boiler room uh, five and six. Now, this could have been um, left open due to human hands uh, because, you know, you've got a crew member down in the boiler room seeing his crew members trying to escape the flooding uh, flooding area and probably tried to help them get easy access to escape that room. And sadly, the door never closed. Um also, the doctors earlier in the day had ordered the nurses to um, open the portals on EDEC. But bearing in mind, the portals are not a direct cause of Britannic sinking. They are a they hastened the sinking. They weren't a direct cause. You've got to imagine the Britannic the Britannic's um, EDEC. They were on EDEC these these um, scuttles or portals and. Um, these were normally 25 above water level, 25 feet above water level. Um, so Britannic had to have sunk considerate, considerably low in the in the water for them to be for the the water to be able to reach these portals. So although the the, the portals did hasten the sinking, they didn't they weren't a direct cause. The Britannic seems to be a, a, a doomed already. But there were other things going off with the Britannic um, during the explosion. The explosion had also severed the cables between the um, the uh, telegraphs and the um, 
the engine room. So the engine, so the only way the captain could get orders down to the engine room was through the emergency telegraph, because somehow the 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 uh, cables had been severed. Also, um, the uh, steering mechanism, the steering gear, had also failed. So the rudder was no longer steering the vessel. Um, so the captain had to use the engines on the port side of the vessel to push the ship, because the bearing in mind, Kia now is on uh, the starboard side of the Britannic, and to get um, the Britannic uh, to towards Kia was to push the ship towards Kia through the engines, uh, which was the propellers, um, which was not the done thing. And realistically, doing this gives you a, a lack of uh, control over your vessel anyway. So you're basically trying to um trying to patch up a massive wound uh this this is just disastrous uh, uh, what could have gone wrong went wrong also with britannic um the the cables connecting to the um the silent room which basically the cables that went from um mast to mast um also severed so they were so they lost communication within the silent room. So they were able to send distress calls, but they weren't able to receive them, but they weren't able to receive a reply. Um, so as far as they was concerned, no one was coming, no one was coming to the rescue or no one had heard their distress call. Anyway, so um yeah, it says have we got um time to go on a bit more or and uh, we can do one more slide, bearing in mind we've only got five minutes left. Okay. Um so as I was saying, um, so the so when the uh, so realistically, Britannic was was in in serious trouble, real serious trouble, and so Captain Bartlett had ordered the lifeboats to be uncovered and to be swung out, but he hadn't ordered the abandoned ship as of yet. So the nurses were going up onto the boat deck, and Captain um, Violet Jessup recollects as saying that you could tell the, the the ship was down by the head. You could see that she was she was in trouble, and she was placed in lifeboat number four. And the two of the lifeboats had been um, launched prematurely, but without the captain's order to abandon ship. But also two other lifeboats on the stern had also um, uh, been launched without the captain's order, but they luckily got away without any trouble. But they were ordered to stay around the ship or around the area to pick up any survivors that were swimming in the ocean. Anyway, um, so Britannic was really, um, really digging, because you've got to imagine the ship is no longer facing the surface anymore. She's now facing bow down, so she's heading towards the seabed. So as the captain is moving the vessel, he's actually drawing more uh, water into the into the hull of the ship and sadly dragging the ship into the ocean. But Captain Bartlett had an affinity with the ship. He had a, an emotional attachment to the ship. He had seen the Britannic from construction. He'd also, he, he was also appointed the captain of Britannic and he'd been on Britannic for at least around a year now. So you know, well, almost a year. So he'd become very attached to Britannic. So he tried to save her and, and obviously as a captain to save souls as well. Uh, but he was unaware what was going off behind him. And two boats had launched uh, prematurely. Bearing in mind, Captain Smith, uh, pa Captain Bartlett did not know about this, this incident until after the sinking. And two boats were drawn into the still turning propeller on the port side which was now working above water, and Violet Jessup was in one of these lifeboats, which I mentioned previously. And um, anyway, Violet Jessup recollects, uh, well, Ada Garland said when she was put into the lifeboat, and she said that she was she was put into lifeboat 17, and that it was the very first lifeboat to be launched from the, I believe, the starboard side. Uh, yeah, the starboard side, I believe. And um, she said that um so she said that she, she when she saw the britannic sink and she said well she didn't see she didn't see it sink completely but she said that she could hear the cries and the screams from the people which she took that as the people being cut up by the propeller and she said that um she saw the britannic dip dip and dip and she was going down by the bows and as soon as it reached the first deck she seemed to lean towards the uh, the starboard side. 
And um, she said that di when she saw the Britannic dip beneath the waves, she said it was like, because she was sounding her sirens and she said it was like she was a dumb, a dying dumb animal or something or something along those lines. Um, but she didn't see the, the, the Britannic sink completely. Violet Jessup, she said she saw the Britannic sink and she said everything in it on the ship just rolled over with the ship, like toys being thrown from, um, from just thrown about on the ship. Um, all the machinery and everything slid with the vessel. Um, as Captain, now bearing in mind, Captain Bartlett's trying to work the vessel towards Kia. Now, because he had no control over his vessel, not well, the lack of control over his vessel, the Britannic actually overshot Kia and she kept overshooting Kia as they were going along. And by the time she the, the mine had struck to when she actually finally foundered, she'd actually done a whole 180, uh, 180 turn and she overshot Kia. And bearing in mind by this time, the, the, the bows are now submerging, the, the uh, forecastle deck is now submerging. And taking on water, so that means Britannic hasn't got very long on the on the surface. So the portals had been reached on on E deck, and they were flooding um, compartments that quite that hadn't been quite uh, thingy. So that kind of hastened the sinking up. If those portals had been closed, she probably would have lasted a little bit longer. But keeping the ship stationary would have kept her afloat longer as well. So yeah, so Captain Bartlett was trying to you know push the ship towards Kia. And trying to save his ship, but you know, as he was doing this, um, as he, as he was doing this, he was forcing more water into the hull. Um, it, you know, which is trying... called force flooding. It does, it does, and yeah. So um, the other thing that had happened during the explosion is um, one of the fireman's tunnels between boiler room six and the fireman's tunnel. The tunnel had actually been damaged, so that was allowing water through as well. So Britannic was seriously, seriously damaged. And you've got to imagine that, you know, on Titanic, Captain Smith had the luxury of having Thomas Andrews, the designer of the ship, on board the vessel to give Captain Smith a realistic view or a near near as realistic view as, as could be given on the fate of the vessel. On Britannic, Captain Smith, Captain Bartlett didn't have this. You know, Captain Bartlett wasn't a ship designer. Um, he had some understanding, but not not a great deal. And although he was getting flooding reports back, I don't think he kind of grasped the seriousness of the situation. It got to around 8.35 when Captain Bartlett noticed that the flooding had increased on Britannic and he stopped the vessel. And uh, as he stopped the vessel, he allowed the 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 boats to be launched, and um, practically every boat was well. Practically every one was uh, um, taken off board or taken off the ship by this point. Uh, by the time Captain Bar uh, Bartlett had started up his engines again to try and take another shot at going getting to um, to Keir Island. Um, a quartermaster had gone down earlier in the sinking to get fre uh, fresh bread from the pantries to fill the lifeboats up with um, food, just in case they are um, uh, they are uh, stranded uh, from from um, any rescue uh, for a while. Um, but by the time the um, quartermaster had come up, the ship was already rolling over and the bow was had submerged, and he jumped overboard. Uh, lucky enough, we can't laugh about it because he did survive. Um, anyway, uh, Captain Bartlett, um, as again, like I said, he, he started up the engines, tried to uh, have another go at uh, attempting to reach Kia. Uh, but unfortunately, by this point, Kia was now on the port side of the vessel. And uh, so she had completely overshot Kia. And um, she was actually facing away from Kia. But by this point, the, the well deck was now filling up with water. And when this happens, you know the ship is not going to last much longer. Uh, but Captain Bartlett... Yeah, near. Exactly. So Captain Bartlett's <laughs> trying to get his wounded ship, his severely wounded ship now. It's like trying to steer your ship, uh, steer a car with its four flat tires on its rims, just on the rims. Uh, so you can imagine the, the struggle that Captain Bartlett did have. Um, 
the ship is now top heavy. Uh, bearing in mind the ship is is weigh, weighs fifty three thousand tons. She's now more than double that, and she's now going down very fast now. Um, Captain Bartlett knew that the ship, as it, as he did stop the engines for the final time around nine uh, eight fifty, and he sounded the um, whistle four times. Um, to give the signal to abandon the vessel because the, the the ship hadn't quite been abandoned yet. There was still crew in the engine room still working on the engines to get the ship towards Kia that hadn't been abandoned. So they had to be uh, signalled out of the vessel. They managed to get up, up through Scotland Road and then up through the... Um, up through the uh, fourth, uh, fourth funnel exit um, uh, hatch and they were able to jump from sea deck on the stern and, and managed to swim away from the sinking vessel. Captain Bartlett was still on the bridge as the ship was going down, and now the water was becoming uh, boat deck level, and uh, the bridge was about to submerge. Captain Bartlett ordered all his crew, including Chief Officer Hume, um, to abandon the vessel, and they... Uh, swam. Uh, Captain Bartlett walked towards the, the the starboard side of the vessel, and he would he didn't jump, he walked into the water, and um, he swam off the vessel just where the the starboard um, gantry davit is. That's where he that's on the forward end of the ship. That's where he swam from, and he was he ordered the starboard port launch to. Um, to to go towards Kia, uh, towards um, Port Nicola, Nic Nicolai or Nicholas or Nicolo, I I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, uh, and he was picked up by lifeboat by the motor launch on the uh, from the port side, and he was pulled into the uh, into the boat by Colonel Anderson, who was the basically the 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 boss of the running of the the vessel itself like the the hospital itself um and he was in charge of the soldiers the uh, RAMC that was on board the, the the they were the only uh patients that were on board the vessel at the time um anyway the britannic rolled over onto a starboard side um Violet Jessup actually recollects Captain Bartlett still dressed in his pajamas as he was still um because he was she was in that lifeboat and she said that when he was pulled out of the water into the boat that he was still dressed in his pajamas because he had uh was taking a bath or about to take a bath before he took his duties on board on the bridge. Um then uh Violet Jessup saw the vessel sink. She said that she rolled over to her starboard side. And as she sank bow first, she went in, and she said all the all the the um the the funnels fell off the ship like matchsticks, um falling over into the water uh, uh, one by one, and she says with a great roar, the Britannic lifted herself up in the air, uh, and she said that uh, and obviously where well, well, the Britannic was was eight hundred foot long, uh, nearly nine hundred foot long. She was 883 foot uh, foot long, um, and she sank in 400 feet of water. So the bow struck the seabed while the stern was still on the surface, and the bow smashed into the seabed and it crumbled under so much pressure that to get the stern down, that the that the that there was so much structural damage to the the bow itself that the bow actually opened up and and separated from the superstructure. Um, and that's where and that's where it lies today. And the stern came down, and Violet Jessup said, with a great roar, the Britannic just slid underneath the water, and there was nothing else but smoke, steam, and 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 wreckage from the vessel. Uh, that was that was all that was left of the great liner. Um, uh, they all was picked up two hours later. Um, in fact, right. Sheila Macbeth, which we will put her recording because there is a recording on this channel um, of, of her testimony of how she uh, her um, experience on board the Britannic, and she said that um, <laughs> she said that there was these boards that were floating in the water, and it was basically these boards that the matron had put up on on the decks of the ship, 
and she said that um, it was basically it was to keep the nurses and doctors separate separate uh, from each other and the RAMC because the matron on board did not believe in um, the nurses uh, be, uh, having uh, having flirtations with the soldiers um, and the doctors on board the vessel. And by, and Sheila made an made a, a bit of a joke because she said that they went, as they went through the wreckage, they saw these the, the those boards um, floating on the water. And she said, you know, and and the, the man behind her said, do you know, I'm surprised the Great Dane didn't put um, signs on each side of the ship that um, doctors and nurses should drown on different sides of the ship. So that was a kind of a, a, a joke towards the matron. Oh, uh, how times are different back then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and 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 Sheila said, I didn't dare to laugh because the matron was quite close to her, so she didn't dare laugh. So you can imagine that that was quite amusing, um, considering all this carnage that had just, just uh, beheld. You know, the, that was their home. Britannic was their home, and they'd just seen their home disappear. It, you know, it's, it's sad. And Britannic was a great loss to the... Um, the medical world, you know, Britannic had a lot of room for pet patients and losing this ship was, was a great blow. Anyway, um, so they all went to, um, uh, per, uh, Percy, I can never pronounce the, the place's name. And they stayed in a mm -hmm. hotel just, just on, in Kia. And they stayed in this hotel and, um, they were there for weeks. And she says, they said that they couldn't do no, enough for them. Honestly, the, the they they really did look after them, and especially some of the people that were sent to the Russian hospitals, um, they were just so kind and and generous and and caring. They they treated them like princesses, uh, and um, it's it, and and Ada Garland said that. Um, when they came into the, the the bay, that everyone cheered and 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 gave them a a round of you know, because they they'd been such trying to sort of um, uh, lighten lighten you know sort of make them feel better I suppose. Um, anyway, um, so after the um, Britannic sank. Um, uh, the the Britannic was uh, discovered in um well they they went home uh, this this was bearing in mind the ship sank in November and most of the nurses <laughs> didn't go home until uh, December and most of them did, wanted to go home for Christmas but they didn't make it home for Christmas and, and so they it was more than a month that some of them actually went home after the sinking um a good six weeks after the sinking anyway um. Britannic laid on the floor, sea floor, for about sixty years before she was found by Jack Custo, Jack Jack Custo, sorry, um, who is who's a, a world renowned um, sea diver, underwater diver, and um, he he basically it was part of it. Now he he found the Britannic, but he wasn't actually there to search for Britannic. His his mission was to find the mythical city Atlantis, the sunken city. But he was contacted by the historical Titanic Historical Society because he was in the area where the Britannic was known to have sunk, and they asked him to go and search for the Britannic. And he was on the his research ship, his own research ship called the Calypso, and um. On the 3rd of December, 1975, they were using side scan sonar. And actually, Britannic was 50 miles from where the actual British Admiralty had marked her as where she'd sank. Back in those days, you know, records were rubbish, you know, you, you know, weren't the great, weren't the greatest. So the, the, uh, the Britannic was discovered um, 400 feet down and... Um, Jack was Jack Christo Stowe did not actually dive the vessel for the first time until 1976, and um, that was the first manned um, dive to the wreck. But he also turned it into a documentary, which can be seen on YouTube, which we can put a link to that documentary below as well. Um, uh, which will it's called Search for the Britannic. And Sheila Macbeth, who was one of the type Britannic survivors, was um, was 
invited to the the wreck site of Britannic and she accepted and she was flown by helicopter over to the wreck site and she was 86 at this point and she was telling her story to Jacques Cousteau and um she wanted she was she was asked or she wanted she was asked if she wanted to dive the shipwreck and she did she went in a submarine the bone submersible which is bone in mind she's 86 years old which is an incredible um experience and in uh, you know she's the currently the oldest person to ever dive a shipwreck um so she she went in the submarine and you know when she went down she wasn't really bothered about the shipwreck no she said the shipwreck was a dead thing but she said the one thing that caught her mind on the shipwreck was the captain's tiles in his bathroom. She said they were glossy and clean as if they'd been just been polished. That's how she put it. But she was more bothered about the um, the sea life around her and around the shipwreck. And she said um, the shipwreck was just a dead thing, you know, you know, but she said that she saw this lobster and, you know, she was just interested in the sea life. But she made a request to Jack Chris Cousteau after she came up that the next dive he does on Britannic, could he get a clock that meant so much to her that she'd left behind in her cabin? Sadly, you know, he never did. Um, but, but, but Jack Cousteau did. Jack Cousteau did pick up some artifacts from the shipwreck. He picked up the brass ring that went around one of the ship's wheels, and he also picked up the Britannic sextant. Um which actually has Britannic engraved onto it. Sadly, we don't know where those items are. He also brought up some coal from the shipwreck. Um, but we again, we currently don't know where they are. Um, some pe some ple people say it's in the Cousteau Society's um, vault or collection, uh, but to this day, we don't know where they are to this day. And they are the only artifacts to ever have been recovered from the Britannic. This was before the ban, came, the, you know, the, the rules came in where you couldn't do it. The Britannic is, right, a, right, right. The Britannic is a very protected wreck. The Greek government will not allow you to, to recover anything from the shipwreck unless you have a permit to do so. If you do not have a permit and you do remove something from the shipwreck, you can spend 15 years, up to 15 years, in a Greek, gov in a Greek jail. That's how serious they take these things. But the other thing is, Britannic is protected under the um, under the British uh, British War Grave uh, reg, uh, uh, Act of uh, 1986, which is under under the uh, which protects her as well, because um, you know people died and some of the RM, uh, RMC uh, soldiers died on on the Britannic, so it's protected. Uh, through that as well, but the Greek government do take it very seriously. Um, but we will be doing a future video on why Britannic cannot be raised from the sea floor, uh, because there is people saying out there that Britannic could be raised, and I can tell you now, I will put a stop. To, uh, and this is a stop to that notion. She cannot, and we will put it. We are doing a video in future for that. Um, for that reason, um, just to just to basically clarify why she can't. It's um, like raising the Titanic. Cannot. Not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Um, but today, to this day, Britannic is widely visited, but you have to be very experienced to 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 be able to um, reach the depths that she's at because although. Although you know she's only four hundred feet below, she's still pushing the uh, the boundaries of human capability. And two men have died on Britannic since the sinking. Um, there was a guy called Carl Spencer who was wildly known in the Titanic community, and he had taken part in many Titanic documentaries over the years. He sadly died in two thousand nine due to decompression sickness due to his. Um, uh, technical issues with his with his equipment. Also, a, a guy called uh, I believe it was Tim uh, Saville, who died um, recently in 2021 on Britannic. So Britannic is dangerous. 
and she's a dangerous shipwreck and she needs to be respected for that. But she is explored by experienced divers and currently, at the time of this recording, um, she is being explored inside the shipwreck. So hopefully soon we will have some future data from those dives. There are some photos dotted around on Facebook showing the odd photograph of inside the shipwreck that pe people haven't seen before. So, you know, hopefully we'll get that data and we'll get those photo more photographs. And hopefully a lot of the questions that we do have about Britannic will be answered through those photographs. Let's just cross our fingers. So that's me. If there's anything you need to add, DK, go oh, ahead. And also, also, one more thing about the Britannic. Unlike his sister ship, the Britannic is the largest ship lost in the First World War, but she never received the same attention as Titanic. No. And if you, th and if you think about it, for both depths, Britannic is easy to get to if you have it. But the only thing you need is training. Unlike Titanic, which is at extreme depths, you need to be really experienced too and trained. Exactly. You need to respect the depths that they are at and you need to respect the dangers that are that are involved. And it's clear the dangers are, ser are quite serious considering that two people have died since Britannic has sunk. Uh, on the, and, and it's due to people, them diving the shipwreck. That anything can go wrong. And when it does go wrong, it's, it's, it's pretty serious, usually pretty serious. Um, you basically, when you're down there, you can have you have dive support, but when something goes wrong, you are basically on your own. Um, but Britannic needs to be remembered, and I'm going to talk about how, why, and how Britannic should be remembered. Britannic should be remembered because yes, she was Titanic's sister. Yes, she was another an Olympic class. Yes, people may not like some of the things that were added on Britannic, like the gantry davits, but the, co the, the the company were not at there to outlook the, co the competition. It was there for safety. The, the gantry davits were there for safety because of what the lessons that were learned from Titanic. Britannic was a, was a great loss to the medical field in the First World War. She was also on a mission of mercy. She was lost in the duty of care for people, you know, there was hundreds of men, thousands of men waiting to go home to the safety of their homes to get to get nursed back to health, to come away from the war zones where they'd suffered trench foot and and shootings and and bombs going off right, left and centre. Britannic was their salvation, their, their way home to safety, to their way home to be nursed back to health. And Britannic was lost in that duty. And those men never got, well, they, they would have got home, but they certainly didn't get home then. So their wait was a much longer than it was necessary. And, you know, than it should have been. Britannic was a huge loss. And it's sad because Britannic, unlike Titanic, Britannic never got to take on one paying passenger. She was lost before she could even be that floating palace that she was supposed to be. And it's sad. And we need to remember her. And we need to appreciate what she was and what she was doing. She was playing an important role in the war. So... um that's that's it for me, really. So thank you for joining us on Historic Travels and thank you for um, just listening to me. Uh, oh, historic Catherine. Travels, you mean History Inside a Nutshell? Sorry, History, History oh Inside a Nutshell. Cut that out. History Inside Sorry, a Nutshell. Sorry, Sam. <laughs> there's, so many, there's so many channels. History Inside a Nutshell. Um, yeah, so thank you for joining us and thank you for listening to me. I know I talk quite a lot and I like to talk, you know. Thank you, DK, for joining me and taking, you are welcome. And taking part in this. Um, but yeah, um, thank you again and hope to see you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you all.
If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe for future videos. Until next time, this has been History Inside a Nutshell, Departing from the Dogs. Thank you so much for all of your support and enjoy the rest of your voyage.